Welcome to another episode of Talking Sock. I'm your host, Pete Davidson. Australian puppeteer Kayla Cabanis has performed with the likes of Cirque du Soleil and the National Theatre Company's War Horse Australia, and she shows no signs of slowing down. I saw full body puppetry, but then I also saw animation being involved as well. In this episode, we talk about Kayla's adventures in puppetry for film and theatre, as well as the challenges faced by international touring puppeteers today. Join Kayla and I now, here on Talking Sock. So Kayla, welcome and thank you so much for being on the show. No worries, thank you for having me. I have to ask you the first question because you've got such an array of different experiences in puppetry, but most of them seem to be big puppets. And so my first question is, why puppets? But moreover, why big puppets? I love the big puppets. They're just just something so... (laughs) enormous about but it incorporates full body puppetry which is what I fell into and I really love because I've always enjoyed physical theatre and full body puppetry kind of goes along the same lines of that because you utilise your whole body and I love that and I love that especially on a big scale production such as War Horse you saw a life size horse puppet come to life and I remember the first time we brought it out in rehearsals it was a little bit overwhelming just because of the sheer size of it and you really do believe that it was a real horse and I love that it required your entire body (laughs) along with another group of two people to make it look like that it's alive and I love that about it. And so that kind of makes me ask the first thing is working as an ensemble in one puppet you know having two to three actors working with you how do you find that synchronicity with the puppet? It took time so with War Horse Australia we had three months rehearsal and my team in particular we were an adaptable team which means that we had to learn two horses in the show so Mm. we had to learn Joey and Top Thorn. So for us, it was a bit demanding because we had to learn two different tracks. It's like learning two different characters for a play. And then you had the other two teams that just had to learn one horse, so either Joey or Top Thorn. So because it was already touring in the UK, because that's where it started, they already had like a pre-planned show. So they knew the choreography, they knew the script, like they knew everything about it. So when they brought it to Australia, they basically had to say to us, this is the play, this is what we're going to do, this is what you need to learn. So... It was kind of good in a way because if we had to start from scratch and like, you know, find the movement, find like everything, like it's good because those who taught us, Finn Caldwell and Craig Leo, they were in the original production of War Horse. So they actually got to teach us, but could give us some hints as well of how they found that synchronicity within Mm. each other. But a lot of the time (laughs) to get us to start off, we would just be in groups and just had to breathe together because we couldn't talk to each other in the show because we were a horse. We had to find other ways of communicating with one another. So it sounds it sounds very strange, but we would um, have sound baths. And what that means is that we would come together as a group and kind of like, you know, huddle around like, you know, in a rug- rugby, you know, kind of position. And we would breathe and make horse sounds and, you know, kind of like snort and neigh. That's and awesome. Then, yeah. And then together we would have to create a horse sound so they taught us that the lung capacity of a horse is equivalent to like three lungs of people like three wow. would be. so it worked out great so it was three of us so we could create that same sound capacity of a horse we would come together and we would try to like make sounds and then we figured out all right if I make this sound that means all right we're going to gallop and we're going to run and we're going to you know and then if I make this sound then we're going to stop so we created a language. Like a language between each other, but through horse sounds. So that was one way of communicating. Yeah. It's so beautiful because I think the first thing I ever learned in puppetry was how to find breath and to find breath in that puppet. And for me, it was Muppets where I had just simply had to give my arm a gesture and, and synchronise that with my arm. But the idea of then using breath as a communication tool really elevates that idea of finding the breath in the puppet, breathing the life into the puppet. And Definitely. Everyone, yeah. Oh, that just makes me... That's like really the first excited thing you learned, that but yeah, you did it quite beautifully yourself. But um, yeah, just breath is the first thing because the very first thing that they gave us, they didn't let us touch the horse at first. First they gave us um, paper and they're like, all right, you're going to create a paper creature. And we're like, what the hell is Here that? we go. Yeah, I'm like, all right, this is a bit weird. So we have to scrunch up a paper and kind of make like some sort of creature out of it and all they would have us do is to breathe with it. Mm. So it was kind of beautiful just watching this paper, just breathing as like and it would move up and down and then it's funny how something like an inanimate object can then breathe 
And that was amazing because they're like, all right, if you can make that breathe, then you can make, you know, this something bigger breathe, you know, wow. and you kind of work your way up from there. But yeah, it started with paper. So that must have been an incredible experience for you doing War Horse. But yeah. can you think of a, the first time that you kind of knew puppets were a thing that you wanted to keep doing? I'd probably say War Horse really solidified that. It was the soft opening night so we my team we were called the purple turtles by the way that's what we called ourselves adorable yeah we were also known as the fart team but i won't get into that um (laughs) yeah we it was the soft opening and our team got chosen to do joey that night so it was the first time we had to actually do the show in front of an audience so of course you know we were shitting ourselves but um (laughs) just because like we didn't feel ready and i remember like asking finn i'm like i don't i don't think we're ready to do this yet i feel like i've just learned what our track is and we already have have to do this for the show and he just said you'll never feel ready and I'm like, okay that's that's yeah comforting thank you but it was that night when we were just holding joey behind the curtain and we're waiting for the sound cue and that's when the curtain gets lifted and baby joey becomes big joey and we just yeah. sit we're just standing behind the curtain and then i remember because i operated the heads so i was on the outside of the horse looking at my other teammates and we all just had like the beardiest like grins on our faces and like we were, you could just tell we were so proud we're like i can't believe we're actually doing this right now and that was such a moment where i remember thinking to myself this is a dream come true right now so I'm just going to enjoy it and from then on I was just like I knew I was a part of something very special and I knew that I wanted to do this for the rest of my life. Wow and so when you say it's a very special is there something about the public community as well that you think? Definitely oh my goodness like after that and um, I know that you know Katie Sugi as well I worked with her on a children's television show called The Amazing House and she was the one that taught me a lot and introduced me into the world of puppetry and the puppetry community. And it is such a lovely family. Oh, my goodness. Like, everyone is so giving and supportive and just lovely. And it's just a beautiful community to be a part of. And then when I was in that, I felt safe. I was just like, oh, this is my people. (laughs) So it's lovely, isn't it? Yeah, it is. There's something about, and in particular, I think, in in Australia, where puppeteers are a a rare breed here. And having people like Kay, who kind of pioneer the the teaching because they've been overseas and they've come back and they've brought that learning to us, this culture of sharing is really yeah. really heartwarming and i think where in an industry like the performing arts where it is otherwise quite cutthroat you have this sort of small gamut of puppeteers who all just want to look out for each other and i i remember when i was working with emma devries on a shoot in april emma is uh, mixie from the ferals and just the amount of things that she was able to teach me just on the fly and in, in a shoot with absolutely no question as to whether or not I knew this already or didn't need to know this or could know this. I just kind of sponged it. Yeah, sponged it, it, totally. And so from War Horse, you've gone further. You've taken a bunch of different large-scale puppets. And I want to know, like, how would you now describe your practice? Like, how would you kind of sell yourself? (laughs) You seem to, you know, have this incredible scale of puppets that are large, but now you're into costumes. And there's one particular show, Martha the Monster, Monster, where you're in a costume puppet and it seems to be a 3D animated head is then projected onto you. So that's taking, you know, the whole idea of puppetry and costume and mask to a different place now. You've got to tell me more about that and you've got to kind of describe to me what what is it that you're doing now? (laughs) Yeah, that was wonderful. I had such a great time doing that short film. It was called Martha the Monster and it also featured um, Rose Byrne and Bobby Cannavale. So um, they did the voices for the creatures, but I was puppeteering Martha and it was like a full body puppet essentially so when I first got in it it was um because it was especially for film you know you have to be a little bit more subtle but because I was in this like full suit I was like oh my actions have to be a bit bigger you know it needs to read because I'm completely covered and I remember the director was saying to me all right you need to tone it down a little bit you know it's very subtle and then I realized I didn't actually have to do too much with it to make it come through and actually a lot of the subtle movements were the ones that really read beautifully as well so um that was something different for me because I haven't done um much suit work so that was like a new opportunity that I wanted to take advantage of as well because it is essentially still puppetry but it's just like in another art form and they did take it to a new level because they did use animation to you know maneuver the eyes and the eyebrows like all the facial expressions as well and that was a bit different because they had to they did have to cover my face with a solid piece of you know the face wow um but then they also stuck like black magnets all over the front of the face so 
that's what they used to do the animation mm. in post. So, yeah, it was in between takes. They did take very good care of me. They would, like, remove the mouth so I could just, you know, breathe, have a quick sip of water. Then, like, they kind of plugged it back in and, you know, we're ready to go for another shoot. So I was still completely um, covered and I remember the two little eye holes that you had to see. So you really did have to kind of use your other senses in a way as well because your eyesight was limited. You had to find other ways to puppeteer it as well. So it really kind of pushed your limits as to what you usually can do and what you've been exposed to in the past. It's like, all right, how else can I make this come alive in different ways? If I can't see, what else can I do? You know, you start to feel things around you and try to sense things, you know, because that took time to learn as well. Do you think, like, how would you describe the difference between working as a puppeteer on film and working as a puppeteer in theatre? Yeah, there is definitely a difference. Um, I think with theatre, you have a little bit more freedom in terms of like, it doesn't matter if you know you, you have a big movement because you know, you're not going to be out of shot, you know, you just you know, this is the edge of stage, this is stage right, this is stage left, I can't really go any further, you know, you have your blocking, it's like, well, with um, War Horse, we had specific, you know, choreography for some bits, but they did tell us, remember, you are a horse. So we also had the freedom to kind of wander off if the actors weren't <laughs> paying attention to us or getting us into like, you know, like like you you do a, a real horse, you know, you guide them, you're like, all right, stay there, graze there for a bit. If they didn't really pay attention to us and we had the complete freedom to just kind of wander off because it put the actors on their toes a bit as well. So we did have guidelines of where you need to go sometimes in theatre, but you have a little bit more freedom within the movement. With film, it's a little bit more specific. It's like, all right, this is, you know, the edge of frame here. We're going for a close up. So, you know, just make sure you remember what you did in the wide shot. You know, you can't just change your movement because then continuity later on, it doesn't quite match up. Yeah. So you have to be a little bit more specific with your movement and you also have to remember it as well. So then, you know, you don't make the poor guy who's doing continuity, you know, you don't make his job too hard. Um, so you just have to be a little bit more specific, I think, with film compared to what you do with theatre. It's certainly more yeah. technical. What do you prefer? Yeah. I love both just because I, I find them both challenging but I do I do love the aspect of theatre just because I love the interaction with the audience. Like I really love that like we do something and then you know you can hear them react like going oh you know and that you know we can hear that and we can see you mm -hmm. as well just a heads up. <laughs> so like it's really nice to have that interaction with the audience as well because you're both going through this journey together and you're both experiencing the same thing. So I, I love that aspect of theatre and then I also love film as well because then you know it's a completely different art form and I love you know going through the process and then watching the film back later going oh oh, that's how it all came together. Because at the time I had no idea what the face was going to look like. At the end, they're just sticking all these like magnets to my face. And I'm like, I have no idea what's going on here. <laughs> so it's like, use your imagination. You're like, oh, okay. <laughs> but it's like later on, you, you look back and you're like, wow, that's amazing how these people were able to create those facial expressions. And it was beautiful. So it's artistic on another level. So they're just two different art forms, but I enjoy them both differently. It's a very diplomatic answer. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit political. <laughs> I want to ask you about being a working actor in the business and, and specifically with puppeteering and, and some of the shows you've worked on, like let's talk about Cirque du Soleil. How does someone get into Cirque du Soleil? <laughs> like how do you audition for that? Uh, you know, yeah. I want to know what that process is like because I think a lot of young people or even actors today are still kind of wondering what is that process because yeah. it's not really genuinely through your agent is it through your agent no i don't have an agent so hey <laughs> she's independent like, yeah i know it's like well a lot of the jobs you hear word of mouth you know you're like oh what's happening there so i found out about Cirque du Soleil auditions through facebook how's that i know right so a friend of mine sent me a link and she was just saying, oh, they're doing a worldwide casting for this new creation. And um, they're looking for puppeteers who have experience doing full scale puppetry in a group. And I'm like, oh, that sounds very specific. And then like you get a little bit excited because I'm like, I actually know how to do that. Yes. So then like I clicked it and I was just looking at their submissions and what they required. And it was a very specific skill set. And it sounds like they were even looking for people who had worked in War Horse as well. And I was like, OK. So, yeah, they wanted people who had full body, you know, puppetry experience, are good with working in a team and are also good movers as well. And I'm like, OK, I'll give it a go. Like I had nothing to lose. I'm like, oh, I'll just... I had no expectations of it because I'm like, oh, it's Cirque du Soleil, you know, they wouldn't even consider reading this, whatever, I'll just go for it. So I sent in a submission and then they were like, 
okay, we will now allow you to audition. I was like, oh, that's not the audition. Okay. Thank you so, for the grace and <laughs> your I presence. I yeah. was like, thank you so much for your acknowledgement. I'm like, all right. <laughs> so um, it was a lot of videos I had to upload to them. And at the time I was in the Middle East, I was in Abu Dhabi, like doing um, another show, The Smurfs, when I got this saying, oh, can you send us videos? And I was just like, oh, shit, how do I do this now? So I went up to the gym in the hotel and I asked a few friends of mine who was I was on tour with as well. I'm like, can you please just shoot these like random videos that I have to upload? And they're like, sure. And they were so good and they helped me out. I love one of them because it was just really random. It was a, a long piece of music, about 10 minutes. It was instrumental, very dramatic. And they were like, the scenario was you have to move to this piece of music. Now, your scene is you've just landed on an alien planet and you're looking around for other life forms and you know you're searching different objects you don't know really where you are suddenly you see an alien in the distance so you go up to them you place your hand on their head and you read their thoughts then suddenly you don't like what you see so you decide to leave the planet and never return and that was the end of scene over 10 minutes over like this was a two minute piece of music you it's had a journey. to do that it was quite a journey Ooh. i was like all right we'll, we'll give this a go so it was completely improvised they just wanted to see it one shot take they didn't wow. want to see that you edited it in any way so i'm like all right we'll just see how this goes so i love the the you know the image of the person who's just on the treadmill looking at you <laughs> in the corner just having an you know an interpretive dance yeah moment. they're just like oh what's wrong with this white girl um <laughs> so yeah i just had like a few random like you know the steps that you get like um that you do in a gym class so it's like a step i'm like all right i'm just going to place that on the floor and that's going to be like my rock that i look over and see what i like and so the fitness ball is the animal. Oh my gosh, it was so good. I was just like, this is amazing. So I did it like three times and then I looked it back and then the friend of mine who helped me out that, you know, the mind that I read and she was like, okay, just stop, stop doing it. Just send them that. I'm like, are you sure? She goes, yep, you're going to obsess about it. Just send them that. So that was one of the videos. I think I ended up sending 15 different videos. Good heavens. Yes. Another one was like me jumping and leaping off a chair. They wanted to see how you leap in the air. Another one was an acting exercise. I'm still not sure what that was. And then one that I still remember quite well is moving from one end of the room to the other in a diagonal and you had to pick a point of your body to lead with. So say your nose. So each movement that you do, it leads with your nose. And I think they wanted to see that movement because the show was Turok, which was based off the movie Avatar. And, you know, if you've seen the movie, you see how they move. They're almost like cat-like. Yes. And they like, you know, and cats kind of like sniff and lead with their noses. So they wanted to see that. So, um, yeah, I had to send them all these videos. And then by the end of it, they replied to me saying, thank you very much for that. We're now going to send this to our board and we're going to review it. We'll let you know between two weeks to six months. Good heavens. And I was like, all right, I'm never going to hear from them yeah. again. I'll just let that go. I expected nothing from it. But then the week later, they actually got back to me saying that I got a, I got a role in their new creation. So, oh, my goodness. Yeah. The, so you didn't like, know that this was Avatar while you were doing the videos? Not really. Like I had I had an inkling from what they were asking because they said it's a new creation based off a very popular movie. Okay. And I kind of had an inkling. I'm like, I think it is the Avatar because like, they said we're working with a director as well and I'm just like it's gonna be James Cameron and so I had a I had an inkling that that's what it was gonna be but um they kept a very hush hush as well and um once they kind of you know made us sign a contract sign away our life and then they kind of revealed all the you know the details of the show wow so yeah then after that we get sent to Montreal which is where the Cirque du Soleil my favorite are. city oh how beautiful is it hey? oh it's the most so fantastic good. place oh, I loved it yeah then we spent six months creating this show from scratch basically so, yeah. so you've lived in Montreal as well. Yeah, I lived every. I lived. Yeah, we kind of went all around because I, I toured with them for two and a half years. So yeah, we can't. We saw a lot of America though. I would love to have seen more of Canada, but we spent yeah. a bit of time in Montreal. But um, how many shows a week does that show run for? We did between seven to eleven shows a week. And it's a one-hour show? No, it's a two-hour show. Two-hour show, 11 two shows. That's more than a Broadway star will do. It's, it, was, it was probably the most intense job I've ever done. They work you very hard, yeah. 
Good heavens. Yeah, um, <laughs> working very hard. Yeah, it's not a cushy business, folks. It really isn't. <laughs> um, so what were yeah. the biggest challenges then? Apart from working 11 shows sometimes, what were the biggest challenges was, of doing like, something like it that? It was, like, I did find it difficult because we did tour for Warhorse, but it was a national tour. It was around Australia. And, like, I'll be honest with you, I was very naive going into this. I think because, you know, when you hear Cirque du Soleil and that you got a role in it, you're just like, I don't give a shit, I'll go, I'll go overseas, I'll do this, sure, I'll sign up. So, like, you know, I signed up up for you know the two years straight away I remember telling my fiance at the time I was like I got in I got in and you know it's just like I'm really happy for you like he was but he was kind of devastated I was just gonna like up and go but like I was just I threw myself into it without really thinking what it was going to be like it was definitely like a honeymoon period for like a year and a half like just because you're completely swept up in this world it's a good length of time though (laughs) yeah it's a good honeymoon period um just because you know like I was just so happy to be involved be in this show and you know I was surrounded by really cool people as well like the cast and crew were just amazing really hard workers and it was just cool to work with people from all over the world as well you know absolutely I've never really worked with like such a culturally diverse group of people who were super talented as well so I was completely overwhelmed by everything and then I think like after yeah the year and a half mark like it started to hit home that I was just starting to get a bit homesick and just because we had to move every week like we move cities every week and sometimes like you know after a 10 show week on the Sunday night we would have to you know pack up all of our gear and then travel to the next destination so you're completely exhausted for Mm. most of the time so after a while I think I it got to me just because it was very physically and mentally demanding. And I did not prepare myself for that at all. Like, yes, I was physically fit, but at the time I had no idea about mental health, how to properly look after myself mentally as well. I felt like I didn't, I didn't have enough support around me to kind of be healthy. So after a while, it did take a toll and I felt like the people I was surrounded with are so lovely. But because you're surrounded by athletes as well, like that kind of got to me after a while as well, like being constantly surrounded by, you know, six packs and just like gorgeous people. And then I, I like I, I started to feel the pressure of mm. the industry. Right. Because what, what they don't tell you as well is that they, they will weigh and measure you every month as well. And, you know, yeah, they do that. And That's for a lot of these, shocking. yeah. Yeah, and for a lot of athletes, that's that's the norm because they, they have to be in top physical condition to do what they do. That's not something that's normal to me. Like, I've always been quite an active person, but not to this extreme. So I think that kind of got to me as well, going, oh, I have to be and I have to look a certain way because what I love about puppetry, it's like, you're not the main focus, the puppet is. Your responsibility is to bring that to life. But in this show as well, I was a puppeteer, but I was also in the first half of the show where I was an avatar. So I was like scene I was in complete makeup and Absolutely, costume yeah. so um and in a you know skin tight uni tight so I think that kind of fucked with my head after a while Absolutely. as well yeah it just got I think after a while I didn't realize at the time but I had very disordered eating and it did end up leading to an eating disorder and I was in complete denial about it because I felt like I was doing what I needed to do to kind of fit in but that's not what they hired me for but after a while I just that took the focus to me because I thought I had to you know fit in and I had to actually look like an avatar which is a completely fictional character but I really felt like I had to become that role to be a part of this world so I think like yeah like so after a while like that did get to me and it wasn't until like yeah I was two two years into it and I was just getting like yeah skinny and skinny and I'm six foot tall by the way but I got down to like 50 kilos and that's just like yeah completely unnatural for me because I've always been like like a bigger stronger woman I just felt like whether it was like the pressure of the industry and the environment because you are in this little you know cocoon where this is your world like you travel with these people you move every week and you're constantly surrounded by the same people I think after a while you kind of lose focus on what's going on with the rest of the world and what other people look like so then yeah I think that kind of got to me after a little while so. It's um, incredibly brave of you to, to share that with us and thank you for doing so. I want to know, what, what would you say to yourself now if you could talk to that person who was in that moment? There's nothing wrong with you and you don't need to 
prove anything to anyone and you are enough as you are and that's that's the thing now like because after one of the main reasons I did leave Cirque is because I, I needed to get help and recover so since then like I've gone through such a big journey and like talked to other other people who have gone through similar experiences and there's like be- a beautiful community that I'm a part of now so I do actually help and teach other people as well who have had experiences with eating disorders and how to help them you know recover and you know just talk about food coaching as well so I kind of help other people with that as well now just because like especially within the entertainment industry it is because there was a lot of other people that I noticed now that um, had disordered eating but because everyone was kind of you know doing it it was normal right but I look back at it I look from the outside in now and I'm like okay that was not normal (laughs) at all so I just I understand the pressures of the industry but like it's it's more rebellious to be no, this is who I am. I actually don't need to change and there's nothing wrong with me. Oh, I love that. Yeah. <laughs> and do you think the industry is changing slowly? I think it is very slowly because yeah. there are more people who are willing to come out going, nah, fuck this, that's wrong. I'm not going to do that to myself anymore. And it's exciting to see that it is slowly changing. I agree. And I think I've seen so much more diverse casts lately that I'm, yeah. I'm hopefully hoping and, and praying, because I'm part of the diversity as yeah, well, definitely. Uh, that that this does become, you know, a culture that we try and uplift people in the industry exactly. of performing arts and that we see normal human beings. Yes, that not we see people that constructs. we recognise, you know. It's just like you, you want to see people on stage and screen and that people that you identify with going, yes, that person represents exactly. me, you yeah. know, instead of seeing the same people, you know, in a very, you know, small box that we put them in, you know, because then people that you can't And then asking, to them. where am I? Exactly, yeah. exactly. So yeah. and I, I would love to see more diversity that would be amazing wow well you are listening to talking sock with one orange sock and kayla cabanas we'll be right back after the break make sure you hit the subscribe and follow one orange sock productions on instagram more with kayla shortly This is Philip Miller. I'm Richard Bradshaw. I'm Sue Wallace. And you are listening to Talking Sock. Talking Sock Podcast. The one orange sock production. This is the number one podcast for puppetry in the country. Your one-stop shop for all things puppetry arts and practitioners. The number one puppetry podcast in Australia. Follow this podcast. Welcome back. You are listening to Talking Sock with Pete Davidson and Kayla Cabanas. We've been talking about the industry of puppeteering for large scale productions that you have done previously, Kayla. But now it's time to talk about more what you've been up to today. So what was the current project that you've been up to? So last week, myself and a bunch of puppeteers we've, that we've all worked with, with each other before we just did a tv commercial for schmeg schmeg like, it's a brand new oven that they're bringing out so we had to have a 20 meter piece of fabric to make it look like smell so think of mickey mouse when he was smelling minnie mouse's pie that she baked on the windowsill and then all of a sudden it's like this wafting smell comes in and mickey like just follows it all the way to the windowsill that's basically <laughs> what they were trying to do so we had this 20 meter piece of fabric and a giant ass fan and many poles to try to keep it in the air so there was five operators with this piece of fabric all together and we had a dancer that was also on wires and she was dancing in the air following this piece of fabric and basically the smell led all the way to the oven and then it disappeared inside the oven and then that's when she realized oh you know I'm baking a little lovely loaf of bread and that's you know that's the commercial that's great. so it, I made it sound very lame but um it's actually a beautiful I think it's going to turn out really beautifully so we did that last week and yeah so next month I'm also heading off to the States for 10 weeks with Monkey Bar's production of Diary of a Wombat. Which you've done here before, haven't yes. you? You've so done that in Australia, so now we're going to take it to the US for a little tour for 10 weeks. So Great. Around the East Coast. You've got these projects coming up, but what do you do in the, in the meantime? What do you do in the downtime? Is there rehearsal time? Is there other projects that you're working on? Are you apparently like, you know, a secret crocheter or something like that? <laughs> what do you do otherwise? What's your gig? I'd love to learn how to do that. Apparently Me too. Apparently it's, it's a really good skill to kind of like calm your mind down. Um, yeah, I kind of do lots of different projects. Recently I had a friend of mine, um, Catherine, who made 
me a hand rod puppet, which is beautiful, kind of think, you know, think of the Muppets, because I figured I've been a puppeteer for this long, but I don't actually own my own puppet. So yeah, I, she just made me this beautiful puppet. So sometimes in my downtime, I just kind of, you know, have a play just to kind of keep my skills up as well. When I was on Circa, I actually had the opportunity to study. So I actually got my certificate for in fitness as well. So um, in the meantime, like as an extra source of income as well, because, you know, in the entertainment industry, you also need to have different avenues, as we all Absolutely. know. So, um, yeah, I'm also a PT as well. So I also do that and I help women with food coaching as well. Ah, right. So, yeah, I kind of do that in the downtime too. And then, you know, hang out with all you lovely people. The puppet people of yes. of Sydney, of yeah. Sydney. We were kind of talking about sort of the people who the who's who of puppetry in Sydney. But who do you kind of look up to or admire in admire. In, this, in current? Definitely have people I admire. So Kay Yusugi would definitely mm. be one of them. So Kay was the one who introduced me into the world of puppetry, and we met on a children's TV show called The Amazing House, and that was the first time I've ever done puppetry and she really seemed like she knew what she was doing so I actually just observed and learned a lot from her as well as long as like I went up to her as well I'm like so how do you do this you know because she also had a lot of technique that I still hadn't learned yet so um and we just got along like a house on fire so yeah we kind of I'll let her tell you this story but about how we first met but Oh, screw it, I'll tell her. Um, <laughs> I'll tell her. No, we were, th- one of the shots that we had to do was that we were in this amazing magical house and we had a big toy box that we both had to fit into and we had to stick our hands through this toy box at the top because our puppets, you know, were sitting on top of the toy box. So we were very close to one another, but as you can tell, like in puppetry as well, you're usually in prox, you know, close proximity. It's an intimate business. It's intimate, so all everyone wear deodorant. Um, <laughs> so we are very close to one another and we just remember that the director was making us laugh and just made a funny comment and I just like I just farted right in her face and that was the first time that we you know really met each other so I was like that's an icebreaker so um yeah she was completely mortified but I can say safely say to this day we're still friends and she was my maid of honor so I feel like we're all good now but um yeah that was yeah it was just so funny but um yeah that's how we first met and ever since then like we just yeah stayed friends Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> I love that story. Um, yeah, she's so true. And so where, after the tour, where do you see yourself taking puppetry for, your, for you? Like, what, what do you think is the next step for oh, you? Oh, like long term? Yeah, long term. Ah, oh, all of the things. I would love to do more TV and film work because mm. I feel like I, that's an avenue I would still like to go down. I do enjoy what the short film that I did for Martha. Like, I would love to see that come into a TV series because at the moment it's on hold in the States. So, like, it did really well in Tropfest and it got a, lots of really good reviews. They're just um, because it's something different that people haven't seen before, they don't really know how quite to market it. But there still has been a lot of talk that they would love to make it into a TV series. They just mm. don't know how to sell it just yet. So, I'm quietly still hoping that that will come about one day. But if not, it just wasn't meant to be. Yeah, I would love to see more puppetry in in film and TV because I find, especially like with kids shows these days, you know, we can remember from our our childhood like puppet shows, you you know what I mean? The ferals. Uh, oh my goodness! Agro? Oh, so, agro! Uh, yeah. Dicky knee, yes, Dicky yes. knee. Yeah, yes. definitely. But these days, you don't see that as much anymore no. because a lot of it's animation, right? So, Absolutely, um, yeah. I would just love to see more of that because the more jobs that I do, and like especially with Cirque, like they were the f- we were the first group of puppeteers that they've ever hired because they actually tried to um, get acrobats to do the puppetry in the show. But as soon as they put them inside one of those um, horse-looking creatures from the movie, the acrobats were like, no, nah, I can't do this. They were just like, no, this is just really awkward and strain on my body that I don't need, you know, because they've never done it before. So they don't totally. know that it's, you know, it's always a little bit uncomfortable when you do puppetry. Yeah. So um, when we came onto the project, it was something completely foreign to them. So us trying to explain puppetry and what it is like they didn't quite understand it like I felt like towards the end they they were a little bit more open-minded about it but I find like some of the jobs that I go on that people you know who aren't in our world they don't understand it so therefore they don't really respect what we do because they don't understand it so in the future as well like I would love for more people to be educated on the art form of puppetry because I think some people don't even recognize it as an art form you know it kind of glorified 
prop movers, you know, in a way, <laughs> like, because that's yeah. how it, it was a little bit on Cirque as well. They kind of lumped us into props. And I'm like, well, we're not props. I'm like, that's a puppet. And they're like, well, it's a prop. No, it's not. It's a puppet, you know. So it's just, it's more just educating people on what it is, because a lot of people don't know what it is. And, you know, when you say, oh, yeah, it's puppets, you're like, ah. Oh, like like soccer or is it like you know the Muppets like they don't really see it's very western centric view Definitely. of puppets as well yeah, yeah I think that's a big problem in America and Australia and sort of the UK anyone that's kind of an English speaking country that's not in the northern hemisphere or in Europe is that it really is just Muppets in, in, in what you see or what you're exposed to and, and certainly what I've been exposed to. But w- would you have a sense of advice or how would you approach that? How would you approach some, some sort of teaching format or learning for someone who, like an acrobat, who hasn't done puppetry before? Because I yeah. think people do come into puppetry like yourself through strange avenues and they just yeah. have to pick it up and have a go. So Definitely. how do you think you would... I think, approach that. I think that's exactly that, just giving it a go. Because unfortunately in Australia, there is no formal training. So a lot of the times you are on jobs where you have to learn on the fly. So I think just being open-minded and willing to give things a try to see what works. It's just having a playful experiment really to seeing what works. And if someone who is skilled in the craft, if they, they do know what they're talking about, then just be open to listening and trying to learn as much as you can from those who have experience, basically. Yeah, it's such a nice thought to just listen and be open in that community as well. And would you be interested in trying other forms like of of puppetry? Because you do lots of large scale, but Mm -hmm. is it something that you're particularly kind of gearing towards now? I, yeah, I like, I do love smaller scale puppetry as well, like for TV and film. Like I do love the hand rod puppets because Mm. I find like they're really expressive and they're really beautiful to watch on TV and film as well. Like I do enjoy that as well. You know, I'd love to have a go at like more marionette, you know, that kind of more subtle and intrinsic kind of art form. Like I love that because that's something I don't get to play with very often. Mm as well so I'm very open to trying (laughs) lots of different things because that's the only way that you're going to learn and grow as an artist as well you know like you of course you have your comfort zone and your strengths and that's what you're good at and that's great but then like in order to grow as well be open and be brave to try different things because that's how I got into puppetry in the first place because like I, I did train as an actor but I wanted to learn other skills as well you know I had the opportunity to be like okay we've got this new kids tv show opening up it's to do with puppetry and, you know, I think a lot of people are like, well, no, I don't want to do that. I'm an actor, which I can, res- you know, respect as well. You do you. But I was I was more curious. So I think having a curiosity also helps. Definitely. Well. Yeah. Any other kind of advice that you would give to young puppeteers, performers or even builders definitely. in Australia? Yeah, definitely. Like, so have, have a curiosity. Do the things that you enjoy doing. So... I find like what kind of led me down my path is that I was curious and I wanted to learn. But also I do jobs that I enjoy and mostly surround yourself with people who are supportive and your support network because that really makes a difference. And I tend to work with the same group of people because I know that they're really good individuals and they're just lovely people. Like Mm. you want to work with people who are lovely, you know, you don't, you, you don't, don't need time to work with assholes, you know, there's no need for it, you know. So there's lots of lovely, talented people out there. So just find them, you know, you find them in the little puppetry communities that we have in Australia, like Unima and Hand in Glove in yeah. Sydney as well. So they are out there. You just have to find them. And everyone is so lovely and supportive. And if you have a question or if you're wanting to meet people, then they do. They're, they're a lovely little network of people. So all you have to do is ask. And that was another thing that I learned is that if I wasn't sure, just ask someone you know because a lot of the times you know we're scared or we're like no I want to make it look like I know what I'm doing I'm like most of the case nobody really knows what they're doing so just just ask and observe really yeah and where do you see it going where do you see the industry of puppetry going particularly in Australia do you think it's going to thrive or do we (laughs) have we got high hopes I hope so definitely like what made me really excited about Martha was that I saw it on a different level. So I saw full body puppetry, but then I also saw animation being involved as well, like how they used that for the facial expressions. And I love that they want to try to utilize that a little bit more as well. So like, I would love to see that to develop and evolve. I would love to see 
more puppetry like in kids shows as well because yeah. I feel like that that's slowly been phased out and kids respond so well to puppetry like and it's a great way to get kids out of their skin if they're a little bit shy and to play with other kids as well like totally. you, you put a puppet in their hand and you just see them light up and you see them that they express themselves in ways that they can't in their own body sometimes yeah and yeah as an educator it's it's really wonderful when you see a student who either struggles socially or even emotionally or might have autism spectrum disorder. And I was speaking about this with Catherine in our previous episode about how it is uh, able to bring you down to this level of innocence that is so sweet and simple and joyous. And I think puppets still do that for adults in a really lovely way as well. But you're right. I think when, when we've sort of opted for animation over the earliest form of animation, which is puppetry, and you can see that in sort of when the bananas and pyjamas switched yes. over or yes. when lots of different shows have done it. But more recently, you know, you've seen Netflix bring back The Dark Crystal mm-hmm. and we've had, you know, a number of different shows. There's another one on uh, Netflix for children, which stars, uh, it's uh, Julie Andrews, isn't it? Uh, sort of it's like glee for puppets it's quite amazing really yes uh, and they all go it's uh it's the green room i think it's called yes. uh, and uh they they kind of canvas all the Broadway performances that are happening at the time in New York and, and they try and put together the Wizard of Oz that with a stage nice. manager and you've got, you know, the little nerdy kid, Riley, who wants to be, like, in the technical <laughs> side of things and you've got the Leah Michelle kind of character who's just the star of everything. And it is really lovely to see that um, not only is there a space for musical theatre and kids now, but there's puppetry being involved in that. And it's all the same actors from Avenue Q and from Sesame right. Street. It's quite amazing. So I, I think it's hard to, to find it in Maine mainstream media but I think it is emerging and hopefully with the YouTube generation and this yes, sort of and that's such a great platform isn't it that yeah. I love that a lot of people having their own YouTube channels to express that and to show their creations as well and I love that Netflix is like getting on on board with this as well and like bringing out different shows that you may not have seen like conventionally on TV so I have I have hopes I think it is making a bit of a comeback And I would just love to see more of it because it would be such a shame if we just saw less and less of it because it is such a beautiful art form and it really does change people's lives. But we just need to see a little bit more of it. We need to we need to pitch it a certain way. You know, we kind of have to make it like puppetry is now, you know, retro is in. Right. Yeah. So like, let's just like pitch it like it's the 80s and, you know, bring back gremlins or, you know, something like that where there's a way of showing the cult classic yes. of the puppeteer or the puppetry kind of business, yeah. Oh, Kayla, it's been so lovely talking to you. Um, we are out of time. You can find Kayla on which links? Where do you exist in the world? Oh, I am on Facebook, but, like, yeah, I have a few videos on YouTube as well, so you just type in my name, Kayla Cabanas Puppetry, and you'll be able to see that as well and some of the gigs I've been on. Amazing. Thanks for listening with us today, and make sure you subscribe for more great puppetry arts and practitioner interviews. I've been Pete Davidson, that puppet guy. We'll talk again soon. Thank you so much, Kayla, for Thank you so much for having me. Pleasure. Thanks for listening. Now we want to hear from you. Each week we'll post a series of questions related to every interview. Join the conversation on Twitter at TalkingSockCast. You can help us bring puppet power to the podcasting world by hitting subscribe, liking our socials and telling your friends. Like us on Instagram at OneOrangeSockProductions and check out our episode blog at OneOrangeSock.com. You can support our podcast by pledging to us on Patreon. Your support helps fund our audio mastering, interview transcriptions, and much, much more. Find the link in the podcast notes and earn yourself a shout-out on our socials. Head to our website at oneorangetalk.com or talk to us on Twitter to see how you can show your support. Our music is composed by Elizabeth Maniscalco and our cover art is by Chad Vanier. Without them, this podcast wouldn't be possible. We'll be back next week with another great episode here at Talking Sock.